Hello and welcome to News Today. Coming up, the Ghana Road Fund generated 1.21 billion Ghana cities from, 20, from 2000 to 2011. On the foreign front, France name is Kimini Nyamani Amano. Stay with me. I'll bring you details of these stories and plenty more in a moment. The Ghana Road Fund has generated 1.21 billion Ghana cities from 2000 to 2011. Deputy Minister of Roads and Highways Isaac J. Menson said, in spite of the financial achievement, the fund carried forward an indebtedness of 210.5 million Ghana cities from 2012 to 2013, increasing the previous year's indebtedness to 59.6 million Ghana cities. It is projected that this year, 264.42 million Ghana cities would be accrued to the fund to enable it to meet uh, the road ma maintenance budgets. The Ghana Road Fund Board, under the auspices of the Ministry of Roads and Highways, organized the forum attended by road contractors, engineers, representatives from transport organizations, as well as municipal and district assemblies and members of the public. The Deputy Minister said the financial achievement of the fund was due to increase in road and bridge tools, as well as vehicle registration, road users and international transit fees. He, however, said the capacity of the fund could sustain only 30% of national road maintenance needs, adding that's why the government has been exploring other financial methods to carry out road maintenance. Now, lung cancer, according to the World Health Organization, accounted for about 1.37 million deaths globally in 2008 and represents one of the leading causes of deaths. Yet, scrap dealers at Abu Bulushi in Accra risk their lives daily scavenging and working with dangerous scrap metals. Yafu Suwajim reports children as young as 15 are also exposed to these hazards. Fifteen-year-old Felix Opon is a scrap dealer here at Agbogulushi, a suburb of Accra. Every day, Felix joins three other senior colleagues to scavenge for metal scraps to make ends meet. He dreamt of becoming an engineer, but the inability of his parents to pay his school fees forced him to drop out of school. My parents know me that I am doing here. Every day I am calling them, so they know that I'll be all right. How yeah. old are you? Me, 15 years. Yeah. Okay, you completed yes. Yeah. Have you completed yes? No, no, no. So, like, you schooled up to which? You schooled up to which point? Yeah, yeah. Like you went to school. Yeah, I went to school. Uh, so, what class did you get before? <laughs> Classes. Class six. Yeah, before I came here. Before you came here. Yeah. Why? Why did you stop schooling? Yeah, because of money, that is why. For the past two years, Felix has been working at this yard at Agbogoshi six days a week for a paltry of 20 Ghana cities daily. His daily routine includes retrieving aluminium and copper wires from metal scraps, a tax his young muscles cannot contain. So he resorts to painkillers for energy to start all over again the next day. I am buying body body spins so I can feel go I can feel go if I buy then I chop then I I drink the medicine. What medicine do you take? I am taking like acrosacin or amugasin. That's medicine that I'm taking. So so do you take the medicine every day? No, I am not taking it every day. Some days I can feel can here where I don't work. Mm -hmm, that is why. So if my body is pain me then I drink the medicine, that's why. Other young men I met in the scrapyard who were within Felix's age group shared similar experiences. Smoking. <laughs> 
it's very hard. You can be working sometimes. Something will fall about some your head or your some place and, and wound you. So you don't know how you do unless you, you are treating yourself. The fatigue aside, there are health risks associated with the scrap business. Scrap dealers like Felix and his colleagues are exposed to toxic chemicals from the cables they bend, as well as the copper and aluminium wires they work with. Although body pains are the only symptoms and Felix and his friends can so point to, how the more complicated issues of respiratory infection will surely catch up with them in time if they continue in this business. Yafusya Jimfi, Joy News. Meanwhile, over 4,000 persons have been screened for various health conditions at the Abubulishi Scrap Yard as part of efforts to reduce the high incidence of lung infections in the area. The screening comes on the heels of a report which names Agbogbulushi Scrap Yard as one of the world's most polluted areas with lead concentrates making it dangerous for human health. Yafuswa Jemfi joined officials from the Ministry of Health for the screening and has filed this report. The Agbogbulushi Scrap Yard is by far one of the busiest business centers in Accra. Located near the central business district of Accra, it is well noted as the hub for electronic waste from Europe, the USA and Japan. The National Youth Council leased the space to the scrap dealers some 17 years ago to conduct business, but the tenants have overstayed their lease and have converted the space to a multiple-purpose yard. A report by the Blacksmith Institute, a New York-based non-governmental organization, has described the Agbogloshi Dam site in Accra as the second largest e-waste processing area in West Africa. It also notes the yard is part of the 10 top places in the world that have reached tipping point due to the burning of cables that contain lead, an extremely toxic substance for the human body. Here at the Agbogloshi Scrap Yard, this is one of the points where cables containing lead collected from the various points are bent to recover copper. Open burning sites dotted along the shoulders of the Kole Lagoon further degrade the ecosystem of the already polluted lagoon. Fumes from bent cables can be seen from afar. With no protective clothes, nose mask and hand gloves, scrap dealers go about their business of burning cables without recourse to the possible health risk to their lives. Yeah, yeah, said Sadly, children are also involved in this hazardous business. Health experts say the fumes from the bent cables are not only hazardous to persons working at the Agbubloshi scrapyard, but also to the general public. The, the danger is not just to them, but to people living around. You understand, there are butchers working also around. And these things can eventually get into the food chain. You may be living very far away from Agbogloshi, but you go to the market and buy foodstuffs, and, and you are exposed to all these uh, risky materials. Apart from the harmful effects of the activities of these scrap dealers on the environment, the area is also littered with plastic, solid and liquid waste. Chairman of the Scrap Dealers Association, Abdullahi Abdul Rahman, however, disagrees with suggestions that they are exposing themselves to health risk. Now, the burn of the copper has come down now. Because how they, they were burning it now, now we have limited. Because sometimes they used to burn it in the night. People have been here coming, say they will help us, they will give us shred machines so that we will stop burning the, the copper and other things. But when they came here, they will go, nobody will come here again. And the copper, too, if you didn't burn it, you cannot sell it. And we cannot throw the copper away plus the, the rubber unless we burn it. If they can help us and give it the shard machines and put it at the back there so that we too, we appreciate it, we like it. 
Meanwhile, a survey by the Ministry of Health indicates that persons living in and around the catchment area of the yard, especially children, are exposed to various respiratory infections. Health Minister Sheriaite says her outfit will partner other government agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agency and the Energy Commission, to significantly address the issue of environmental pollution. After the screening, we will follow up with our advocacy. Our public health team will be here. And we must also ensure that uh, the various institutional bodies that are you know, supposed to enforce our regulations on, you know, dumping of electronic waste in the country, I mean, we, they must also wake up to the call that uh, there's a need that we must protect the health of our people. Over 4,000 people were screened by the close of day. The 2014 budget, read by Finance Minister Sir Tepe on Tuesday, outlined some transparency and anti-corruption measures. Now, these measures include additional budget provisions to strengthen anti-corruption agencies, notably Shraj. Also, a percentage of proceeds of corruption, when recovered, will be paid to anti-corruption agencies instrumental in exposing such acts, and this will further strengthen their resource base. On the line now is Executive Director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, Vitus Azim, who would find out how this could be in instrumental in uh, curbing the practice of corruption. Hello, Vitus. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on News Today. You're welcome. How would this move by government to, you know, give quota of uh, monies or corruption booty recovered to uh, anti-corruption agencies that were instrumental in, in, re in recovering it? How would this cap the practice? Well, you know, a lot of the, or many of the anti-corruption agencies have been complaining that they don't have enough resources mm. to carry out their work. The staff, they the recruit staff train them and some of them leave for better places where they are, they are better paid. And even some of them are just paid their salaries, but they're not able, they don't get enough money to go out to the field to do the work. Right. And, and so if this means enhancing their resource allocation to them as an institution, it will help them to, do, to, to, to carry out more work or right. to do their work more effectively. Mm. But if it's just a compensation, like a bonus to be paid to staff, I don't think that uh, we, I, I wouldn't personally uh, support that approach because we already have a whistleblower law in place that is supposed to encourage and protect people who blow the whistle on corrupt officials. And so we should rather be thinking about allocating, giving percentage of that money to the whistleblowers or people, individual citizens that have done enough to help the state recover money, like the, 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 the work of Honorable Martin Amido. He spent his time, probably spent resources, doing this, getting a, a, a ruling in favor of the government on, in, in respect of Waterville and the, uh, Astrofoto. So the money that will be recovered, a certain percentage of it should be paid to him for those efforts. Mm. And that will encourage other people to do the same thing. Mm. That, should, should government do this for anti-corruption agencies? What challenge do you foresee as heaven because some have argued that really this this could only may encourage them and put them into an overdrive and and perhaps i it could be abused yes that's what i'm saying that it should be given to them as an institution as an additional resource allocation to them to carry out their work and not given to them to pay to themselves as a bonus that's how i think i, I see it I see. Uh, now, many... so it, will, it will only be filling a gap that is missing. But you see, on the case, in the case of Shrag, for example, the government about three, four years ago decided that they should be able to prepare their budget and come and defend it straight with parliament. Mm. They don't have to pass through uh, the, the cabinet. And so if they prepare a budget saying that this is what we need to do, one, two, three, for the year, there's no need giving them additional money. Whatever money they recover should go into the consolidated fund. Mm. Let, let's, talk, let's talk about Shraj for a minute. It, it, is finance the biggest problem for Shraj? Uh, I don't think finance is the biggest problem. Maybe, maybe it's one of the problems, but I don't think that it's one of the big. I mean, it's the, it's the biggest problem. The problem one, one for me is the independence for them to do what they want. 
I mean, what, what, what the mandate requires them to mm. do. Because they do investigations and uh, they, they end up in the Attorney General's department or somebody to now say, okay, I want to take this. This thing is worth considering. I want to take it to court. And so we saw us have been calling for uh, the giving of prosecutorial powers to Chirac so that when they do the investigation and they found that it's necessary to go, go ahead to prosecute, they should be able to proceed to the court to, to prosecute. Mm. We'll, we'll leave it here for now, Vices. Many thanks. Vices Azim is Executive Director of Ghana Integrity Initiative. I will move on to some other stories. And that a complementary basic education program has been launched at Pelungu in the Napdam district of the Upper East region to help over 1,000 out-of-school uh, out children get into the mainstream educational system. Upper East correspondent Albert Sori reports. The Complementary Basic Education Program is a functional literacy program by the government of Ghana and its development partners for children between the ages of 8 and 14 years who are not in school to gain access to formal education through literacy classes in their own communities. The intervention is in line with government's efforts to meet the Millennium Development Goal 2 of achieving universal primary education by 2015. The program is being implemented by civil society actors in partnership with beneficiary communities with oversight responsibility by district education officers, district education oversight committees, and district assemblies. In Namdam district, volunteer teachers for CBE program took special preparation course in readiness for their role and were awarded certificates at the launch. Edward Azuri is the Namdam District Director of Education. In all, we have uh, 60 classes in uh, 50 communities that we work in. We're trying to get children between the ages of 8 and 14 who are out of school to go back to uh, school. So they are going to go through this program for nine months and to go back to uh, school. The Namdam District Chief Executive Vivian Anafo said the introduction of the CBE program in the Namdam District has come at the right time. She was also optimistic that the program will be successful. Today, in NAPDA has been another milestone of educational enhancement. I'm particularly happy because we are touching the lives of children who are no, not in school for no fault of years. In the Upper East region, Africates Ghana, a child rights centered NGO, is partnering government in implementing the CBE program. The Ashanti Regional Director of Town and Country Planning is proposing a public-private partnership to build rental units for workers in the region. This resolution, did you say, says will help solve the housing deficit in the region. Mohamed Nuruddin reports. Ideally, everyone would love to live in a house they can call their own, but the cost of land building materials and labor makes it impossible for this to happen. Thus, many continue to live in rented apartments. Due to these challenges, some individuals buy half plots of land to build their houses. But according to the town and country planning, building on a half plot is not recommended. A plot of land for building must measure 100 by 100 feet to create room for fences and for health and other reasons. According to the regional director, the number of individuals who submit applications to the town and country planning department seeking permit to develop their lands has been fluctuating since 2010. The highest record was in 2012, where 125 applicants were approved as compared to 28 approved by 20th November this year. There have been instances where prospective landowners have not been able to provide evidence of land title from the Lands Commission to enable them get approval to develop their lands. There are others, however, whose applications do not meet the standard requirements, hence are rejected. Some members of the public have been sharing their views on putting up a house. 
Looking at the which the two the two sides of the coin, you realize that uh, in as much as uh, acquiring your own land is best, but there are people who also would want to take your money and then perhaps cause a lot of problems. But I personally want to believe that if uh, you purchase a land and then somehow would develop it, because whether I like it or not, there will be genuine people. So you pray you get in touch with some of those new guys, and then probably you get the land, and then organize yourself just systematically, and then with time you get your own building done, and then you move. It is far better than staying in a rented apartment. For how long can you stay in somebody's apartment? Tomorrow the person might come and tell you that a relative is coming, so you move out. Why are you, why, why, why are you going to move to? If that time you don't have the money. Yeah, dear, yes, it will be a day. It's now, now no one can say fear, but I want to say something a day. And yeah, easy, sir. We bet me a court plot, and after the plot, no. And who say be brave? In least no crown here. The back of court, I'm for four and sign here. The court two for one poker so on sign and no crown. No whole canoe. It's in the dining. The wall will be a year. But rented apartment. It's only at times a few rough on your day. A hygiene. It's only a person. Oh, be a so be a dream. This will be seen if you. You watch and join us today, and I will be right back. Thanks for staying on news today. Now, an economist and policy analyst, Dr. Theophilus Edward Richardson, says the top new funds, the two new funds, rather, proposed in the 2014 budget, though commendable, cannot be sustained with VAT proceeds. He also expressed disappointment in the budget, which did not clearly address the fundamental problems of the economy. For the program-based budget it was touted to be, Dr. Richardson said it lacked a clear focus and also did not specify the programs to be achieved. He was worried it also did not adequately address government's overspending. I don't think that, you know, the government priorities have been set right, although there is a claim by minister that the budget represents an attempt to realign priorities. I think the government priorities are still misplaced and misguided because they are driven by the politics of patronage. What I would have liked the president to do was to reduce his present salary of 12,000 Ghana cities a month to, is it about 8,000 Ghana cities a month in 2012, before it was increased, you know, to this 12,000. That would have been more than a symbolic, you know, uh, gesture. And I think that this will not amount to much. But the government also have to cut its size. In fact... For every, we don't need more than 50 ministries in this country. The Ghana Infrastructure and SME Fund announced in the budget will both draw from VAT. He, however, does not believe it is prudent for government to continuously introduce taxes to fund projects. Anytime a new, some project uh, or sector of the economy needs need some financing, it means government will have to raise new budget. I'm asking that question, the restitutional question, and the answer is no. Well, they have, um, you know, removed some taxes. We talk of agricultural impulse, uh, condoms, you know, energy saving bulbs, and uh, what have you? Uh, how many times do we buy bulbs? I'm talking of consumption taxes, the VAT, you know, which affects even the poor most. So the tax issue is not only an issue in do I say economics and public finance? But it's also an issue in governance. And beyond a certain threshold, we are just as likely to see some revolt. And we cannot predict the consequences, long range consequences of that revolt. I think there has been too much taxes. Dr. Theophilus Richardson also advised government to desist from excessively borrowing from the foreign capital market. We'll stay on the budgets. Also, a senior economist at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Dr. John Kwache, has criticized government for its lack of ambition and drive in the 2014 budget. Addressing the media, Dr. Kwache explained he was disappointed the budget failed to indicate how government intends to address the skyrocketing unemployment situation in the country, as well as the depreciation of the Ghana city. A tax to GDP ratio, tax effort is not ambitious enough. Expenditure is probably overambitious. You know, I'm, I'm saying that expenditure is too high. Tax is not enough. Inflation, you know, we are not being ambitious enough because we are nowhere near the West African Monetary Zone target, let alone global inflation. It seems that this economy is disconnected from the rest of the world because we have inflation going up. When in some countries, inflation is down to zero. 
He, however, commended government for establishing a SME fund, which he noted will support the manufacturing sector immensely. My understanding is that it will be funded with the additional VAT increase, that's 2.5%. I would want it to be fully funded. I'm still not happy about the fact that when, when I go into the budget and I see you know, capital spending, it's just six billion or so allocated to it. And in terms of GDP, six billion may look so big, but in terms of GDP, it's five point seven percent. Okay, when interest payments alone is taking six five point nine percent of GDP, so it doesn't. It looks huge in absolute terms, but in re relative to the size of the economy, it's not. It's not that huge. So I would want more rebalancing of the expenditure, you know, cutting the recurrent expenditure, um, you know, more. Dr. Kwachi also expressed concern about government spending, which says after the 3.1% of GDP in 2014 is still high, even though it is down marginally from 2013's 34.1%. He also called for a leaner, less bureaucratic, a more productive public sector in order to manage government's wage bills as part of several efforts to reduce spending. We'll go on to the stocks market now. And as of Monday, November 18, 2013, the Ghana Stock Exchange Composites Index year to date was 76.62%. And as of November 21, it was 77.51%. Market capitalization of uh, Ghanaian on Monday, November 18, was 58,094.31 million Ghana cities. The capitalization was uh, 58,256, uh, 57.92 million Ghana cities as of Thursday, November 21, 2013. I do agree with you, those are a lot of figures. So, David Odoi Dankwa is, is here with us in, in the studio. He's researcher at Goku Securities Limited. You would help us understand those figures. But then also, you recall that we started an overview of the various stocks on the GSE. We started with Fund Milk. We did with some fundamentals last week. Today, we are continuing with uh, some of the technical overviews. He would help us go through all that. Many thanks. I always tell you, it's a pleasure seeing you. I, 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 I like your shirt. Don't worry. You, you're, you're, giving me, you're giving me a copy <laughs> next week. I'm, 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 you will look at that. I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm demanding, requesting. Okay. Right. So let, let's let's first start with an overview. Then we'll do fan milk. We'll wrap up with fan milk. Let's look at an overview of the market. Overview today. of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, looking um, at the market, as you said, you can mm -hmm. see um, the the market index as at close of yesterday was up. That's the broader market index, meaning the market is really is is doing well but not the the best because looking at monday the index was down from friday's um that was last week um friday's um performance and on tuesday the market was down again but wednesday thursday the market recovered by pushing up some mm. points but we are looking that maybe today too the market will be up a little but that is not to say the market has stabilized mm. because getting to the last quarter of the market we are expecting the market to be a little bit um unstable looking at some economic indicators in the country and some um, conditions uh, inflation going up and some other things it makes the environment the um, investing um, climate not pleasant for um, investors to bring in their money especially the foreign investors so the market would dip a little mm. and we have a normal um third quarter um last quarter uh, financial um, pressure, uh, mm. the pressure on the financial market also going to affect it. So the market will mm. not be that um, much yielding mm. in the in this um, particular but moment. You, but, yeah. you know, I I think with all the figures I mentioned earlier, yeah. for someone who just wants to put my money in there, sit back and let it work for me, the answer to the 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 only question I want to answer is: Is there money? On the GSE at the moment, yeah, it's, it, there is money on the GSE. But as we started with our education, we said the stock market is meant for long-term investment. Mm. So if you have money that you are expecting to get, maybe um, returns within the next two months, it mm. can be possible. So if, if, I, if I have my money in there at the moment, yeah, it is it, it is working. 
it's working. Mm. Yes, because some of the stocks are making as much as 120% on the investment. Um, that is yet to date. So you can, be, you, can, you can see a lot of investors are really getting it. Right. But when you go onto the market, you don't, ha you don't expect to get your money, your money within days. Though some people can just get it. You can go there and tomorrow you might just even receive about 20% increment on the market. And you might go mm. there and tomorrow your price might also come down by maybe same uh, percentage. So you just go onto the market for a long-term purpose. Mm. Okay, let's let's talk about fan milk now. Let's okay, talk about fan milk. looking at fan milk, you know, last week we just looked at um, some of the fundamentals as profit and the revenues of fan milk, and as we established, fan milk has been doing well over the years. But just um, the beginning of this year, because of the power crisis, they've not been able to perform as they, 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 they were expecting. So mm. comparing, having a year-on-year -year analysis that is comparing this year's performance to last year in terms of percentage, not absolute figures, you can see the market is not doing, um, the, the stock is not doing that well. So we are going to see how that has impacted on the um, prices of um, farm milk or the performance of farm milk on the stock market. The, uh, the stock that is farm milk started mm. the year with 33 Five three. The, the year as in 2013. It started. It started 2013 mm. with um, a price of 3.53 Ghana cities, mm. um, and this was um, um, as a result of the the, the performance of 2012. And you can see at the end of the first quarter, the stock was already yielding. Um, first quarter, the stock was already yielding five point. Uh, mm. Was already 5.45 Ghana cities. So you can see the stock as at the close of first quarter had made a lot of returns, and this was because the stock was able to do that their operational performance was very good in 2012 closing mm. 2012 so that reflected on the market um, in 2013 the second um, quarter also closed at 5.80 that you can see the stock was still what moving and I as of yesterday the stock was 6.60 and even the stock moved to about six 6.68 but it has started dropping again as we said earlier on um, the inability for the stock to perform extremely well or as investors were expecting is having um, a bit of toll on the stock's performance on the Ghana stock because investors are looking for money and once the money is not coming some people are some people are not patient enough to wait for the stock to recover or for the um, company to be able to just um, post the year, end of year financial mm. they are just anticipating then it means the company might not do well at the close of the year so they started um, giving um, lower bids but the stock in all has not done bad at all as at close of um, October the stock has made about 89 percent year today so you can see farm work is really doing well on the ghana it, stock it, it is indeed uh, and thank you very much as well David. next week we'll do something else but next like you said it should else. come from yeah, our, 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 our viewers. viewers so we're still waiting for them they should just give us the stocks that they want us to just delve into and tell them what is going to happen to the stock maybe before i close let me just give a brief um, outlook of farm work getting mm. to the close of the year farm work might be dipping a little I so see. that if you have money this is the time to buy farm work because it will shoot up again when they're able to stabilize this year and moving forward next year mm, i see many thanks david most welcome david odoi Dankwa is a researcher at uh, gold coast fund management but you had him if you'd want us to you know analyze any stock on the gse all you need to do is to send us a tweet join news on tv or a post on facebook join news on tv as well or perhaps at my personal handle at kemini uh, but we move away from the stocks now and talk mobile phone or cell phone. A Silicon Valley jury has ruled that Samsung must pay $290 million. That's just about 800 million, 880 million pounds to Apple for copying iPhone and iPad features in its devices. This verdict comes after a previous jury found Samsung owed Apple one point. Zero five billion uh, dollars for copyright infringement. You recall how uh, Samsung paid Apple back in that one point zero five million dollars in pennies. However, U.S. District Judge Lucy Cole ordered a retrial because she said that jury, the jury miscalculated the amount Samsung must pay. Samsung is expected to appeal. Apple said in a statement, for Apple, this case has always been about more than patents.
and uh, money. It has been about innovation and the hard work that goes into inventing products that people love. The jury's ruling covers 13 of the 26 Samsung devices uh, that Apple had argued copied its technology. These are mostly older Samsung tablets and smartphones. I'll take a quick break. When I return, we'll do some sports news. You're welcome to the sports segment of Joy News today. And Ghana forward Andrea Yu is facing eight weeks on the sidelines after injuring his knee while in action for the Black Stars on Tuesday. The 23-year-old came off after 50 min 55 minutes in the 2-1 loss to Egypt in the second leg of the World Cup playoffs on Tuesday night. Ghana, however, clinched qualification to their third straight finals on a 7-3 aggregate scoreline, having smashed the Ferris 6-1 in the first leg. The game, however, ended with a year in reading pain following his injury. The forward now requires surgery after further examination on his return to Olympic Marseille. Confirms he has suffered a meniscal tear in his left knee. Ayo is now being prepared to have the operation on Monday, after which his, he is estimated to be out of uh, out for eight weeks. The son of Ghana legend Abedi Pele will hence be expected to be back in full action by the end of January after the winter break and the French League One. Ghana Black Star coach Chris Yapia has been talking to Joy Sports on the World Cup draws. Let's take a listen. For me, um, as to which team you know, we get in, we, me, it doesn't actually matter which team we, you know, we, we go in the, the, the same group. Whatever group we fall in, I always believe that, you know, we've got the capabilities and our players should be able to cope with it. You know, if you thinking of not facing Brazil or Spain or something, then why are you going to the World Cup? You know, you should be able to prepare yourself to face any team that comes your way. So you don't mind facing Brazil in the opening uh, group or in the opening stages of the competition? I mean, once you go into the World Cup, you go into the World Cup with the intention of winning the World Cup. And how can you win the World Cup if you afraid of Brazil or Spain or whatever? Let's check out the English Premier League now. A quick preview. Everton will face Liverpool while Arsenal will take on a Southampton, Fulham and Swansea City, Hull City and Crystal Palace. Newcastle United will face Norwich City, Stoke City will take on Sunderland, West Ham United and Chelsea, Manchester City and Tottenham Hotspur, Cardiff City, Manchester United, West Brom Albion will then face Ashton Villa. And that will be all for sports. You're welcome back to Joy News today. Uh, we check out news from elsewhere. France says the Central African Republic is on the verge of genocide and that the United Nations may allow French and African troops to intervene. Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius said the Central African Republic's neighbors and the international community are uh, concerned about the unrest and that the UN is considering a resolution that authorizes French and African forces to take action. The Central African Republic sank into chaos after the Seleka Rebellion coalition overthrew President Francois Bozizé in March. The unrest has displaced about 400,000 people internally and created a dire humanitarian situation that UN chief Ban Ki-moon says has affected all of the country's 4.6 million people. Some of the recent violence appears uh, religious based with both churches and mosques being the target of attacks. The African Union is set to take charge of an existing peacekeeping force next month. The force is due to expand from 2,500 to 3,500 soldiers. But human rights groups 
and UN humanitarian officials have called for stronger action. On Wednesday, for instance, the United States said it would spend 40 million U.S. dollars to help stabilize the CAR. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said the money which provide peacekeepers with logistical support, non-lethal equipment and training. International news analyst Ilbert Ibrahim has joined us over the telephone would assess uh, this uh, Central African Rep Republic situation and the fact that France is set to be on the verge of genocide. Hello, Robert. Good afternoon, Cameron. Good afternoon to you. But uh, what reading do you make into the, the comments by, uh, by France? Really, it's, it's uh, CAR on the verge of genocide? Cameron, yes, I think a strange global pattern has been taking shape in the past three years. Mm. The French seem to be the ones championing all Western military interventions in Africa. They got militarily involved in the outer of Laurent Babo of Côte d'Ivoire. They and the Brits pushed for a no-fly zone resolution over Libya, the UN Security Council. They almost single-handedly dislodged the Tuareg rebels in Mali, and now they are calling for a swift intervention in the Central African Republic. I think Francois Hollande is pursuing the robust foreign policy circles he started. Mm. That may come back to haunt him in the next presidential elections anyway. But something indeed has to be done to avert the genocide in the CAR. The country is sparsely populated, and it has been marred by violence and chaos since the Leka rebels, many of them coming from neighboring Chad and Sudan, outside the former president, just as you mentioned. The U.S. State Department says even in addition to the 400,000 that have been displaced, 68,000 are seeking refuge in either volatile parts of the continent. To the northeast, we have Sudan, and you know so well what happens with the Janjaweed forces in Darfur. So there is entire instability in the country, and the violence has increasingly pitted the mainly Muslim rebels against Christian militias. Mm. Uh, Christians make up half the population of the country, and Muslims make up 15% of the country, according to the CIA. Mm. So I think a French-led intervention is necessary if that will stabilize the situation. But already there is a subtle French military involvement in the conflict. France already has some 400 troops in the country, mainly protecting the airports and French assets in the capital. But it says it wants to ratchet up that number to 700 or 1,200. So certainly something needs to be done. The country is rich in mineral. Mm. It has large reserves of gold, diamonds, and uranium. And therefore, if that will bring prosperity to an impoverished 4.6 billion people, and certainly the country has to be stabilized militarily. And the U.S., on the back of that, it said it would invest $40 million. Uh, it has been clear it would be into non-lethal equipment, uh, but into training. How crucial is this? It's just important because it's just money that, you know, greases the wheels of any intervention. No army can fight on an empty stomach. So mm. therefore, people need to be fed. Yeah, it forms part of the contingency of every military intervention. But the fact that France, France is in the fall doesn't mean that the U.S. as a world superpower is missing in action. Mm. The, the, the Americans have adopted what we call the leading from behind uh, kind of policy. So they push the French people to be at the facade of whatever military involvement they want to have in Africa or the Middle East, so that they can deflate or parry off some of the uh, anti-American uh, sentiments in Africa and other parts of the world. So financially supporting the campaign uh, it will be crucial to the success of any French intervention. But imp more importantly, Kemeni, mm. I think Africans should be left to solve their own problems. François Hollande in October met the South African president, Jacob Zuma. And Jacob Zuma reiterated the fact that any contingent, contingency should be African-led. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Erbad, for, uh, that, uh, for, for the, the interview. Everybody, Ibrahim is an international news analyst. Move on to some other stories. Um, eat nuts, live longer.
Researchers have found that those who eat a handful of peanuts or cashews every day significantly decrease their risk of dying from all causes compared to those who do not eat nuts. A new study concludes that all types of nuts seem to be protective. It does not matter whether the uh, peanuts grown on the ground or tree nuts such as almonds, brazil nuts, hazelnuts, walnuts or cashews. Those who eat nuts at least five times per week seem to be healthier and live longer than those who do not consume nuts regularly. Researcher Ying Bao with the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard University Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts said she and her colleagues looked at the impact of nut consumption by analyzing two huge studies that began in 1918. Now the studies are the Nurses Health Study which tracks the well-being of more than 76,000 women and 42,000 men enrolled in the health professionals follow-up study. In Kenya, the country has searched the international crop away from international news now and do some showbiz uh, stories. And Africa's literacy circle has suffered yet another loss with the death of renowned Nigerian writer Professor Festus Iyayi. He was killed in a car crash in Kogi State, Nigeria. The year 2013 has not been a pleasant one for Africa's literary community. So far, two of the continent's biggest literary brains have died. Renowned Nigerian writer and father of African literature, as he was called, Chinua Achebe, died in March 2013. And just when it appeared the literary community was overcoming its grief, Ghanaian poet and statesman Professor Kofi Awuno was gunned down by terrorists at Nairobi's Westgate Mall in September 2013. Before the year wraps up, another major literary icon, Nigeria's Professor Festus Iyayi, has also died. Professor Iyayi was killed in a car accident in Kogi State, Nigeria, while traveling with a delegation from the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, to discuss the four-month-old strike by the Nigerian University Staff Union. Professor Iyayi, whose literary credits include violence, the contract, heroes, and awaiting court martial, was a founding member of the Pan-African Writers Association. Until his death, he was the association's program's development advisor. Secretary General of Power, Professor Tukwe Okain, in a statement said Power and Africa have been robbed of an illustrious son. The statement, however, notes a delegation from Power, led by Professor Okain, has visited the family of the late author in Benin City, Nigeria, to express its condolences to the bereaved family. That will be all for Showbiz. A look at our headlines again on Joy News today. Ghana Road Funds generated 1.21 billion Ghana cities from 2000 to 2011. Francis, for watching, my name is Kemini Nyamani Amana. Don't forget the small news on myjoyonline.com. And you have yourself a lovely weekend. Goodbye.